All right, if there's nothing else, Will, do you mind saying a prayer for us? Will? Good morning, Father. Thank you for this day that you've given us on this earth. Thank you for bringing us safely to your house of prayer so we can worship and praise your holy name. Please be with all of our class that are unable to be with us today. And we hold up all the names that are on our, on our prayer list. We know each and every one of them. Please comfort those that need, need to be comforted, heal those that need to be healed, and save those that need to be saved. We thank you for your justification with the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for sanctifying us every day of our lives and every day up until the day that we die. And then we look forward to your glorifying us. That will be a glorious day. Please be with uh, Bob as he teaches this lesson today. And be with Jacob later on in the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming out today on this cold morning. Be careful. And make sure your pets are in. Pipe wrapped. Be careful that you have to be traveling. I do want you all to consider praying for our search committee. We uh, have a really good chairman over the search committee, Dan Floyd. He's uh, it's like a little spark plug. He's just uh, very, he's just a um, very faithful young man and uh, got everything really organized. Uh, we know God has picked somebody to be in this role. We just pray that uh, the search committee is smart enough and wise enough to listen to the leanings that uh, God will provide so we'll get the right person in here. Who did you say he was? Chairman? Jans Floyd. <clears throat> Jan? Jans. 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 Oh, Jans. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, I know him. <laughs> I don't think your speaker's close enough for some of us. We can't eat. We're struggling. I don't know about the ones on the back row. <laughs> they won't speak up. I will speak up. <laughs> Daddy's never told me that my voice is down. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? Better? We're going to start a new uh, study this morning. Um, this section is going to be entitled Owning a Faith That Matters. And this particular study is uh, was uh, worked on by Matt Tullis and Janice Meyer. And the title of this study this morning is called Life Changing Faith. I hope you had a chance to read it. It's uh, going to be out of the passage from Luke 5 verses uh, 1 through 11. And we know the point of this lesson and the point of our life is faith begins with the call to follow Jesus. And we'll be, we'll be talking quite a bit about the disciples, how they were called just like we're all called, and how they grew to have faith in the Lord, how they grew to follow Him. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the disciples, how they were called. The old Chinese uh, proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. It's a familiar statement. It can be applied to our faith. Uh, we all have to take that single step of you know, putting one's faith and trust in Jesus to follow him. Of course, that's just the beginning. Uh, the rest of your life, uh, if we're doing what the Lord expects us to do, and that's to, uh, to grow in our faith and continue that journey the rest of our life. As I did say uh, before, the um, passage today is Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. So what's the setting of this particular uh, passage in Scripture? Luke was a physician. He was a Gentile. He was a uh, good buddy to Paul. Uh, he went on uh, the uh, missionary journeys to the Gentile world. He recorded a lot of those in the book of Acts. He... Uh, probably wrote the Gospel of Luke from Rome where he was uh, with Paul in one of his imprisonments. So it's dated sometime between uh, AD 61 and 63 and we know that 
in the uh, Gospel of Luke in Luke 4, we know Jesus had already healed Simon, one of the disciples' mother-in-law. So this is the context and the setting for what we're going to be studying today. And then after we read uh, Luke 5, 1 through 3, I'm going to go back and look at, this was probably not the first calling from the disciples in, in this particular uh, passage, 1 through 3, but we're going to go back and look at maybe some of the other encounters that the disciples had with Jesus prior to their commitment. So, Will, if you'll read Luke 5, verses 1 through 3 for us, please. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the calls on the disciples, just like we were all called uh, into uh, following Jesus, trusting in Jesus. So in John 1, verses 40 through 45, goes like this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the men who had heard that John, what John said, and then followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, you are Simon, the son of John. That's not John the Baptist, of course. Several Johns we uh, know about. But you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Come, be my disciple. Philip was from Seda, Andrew, in Peter's hometown. And then Philip went off to look for Nathanael and told him, We found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. So when you think about it, Andrew may have been uh, the first one who started introducing Jesus to all these other disciples, just like we're called to do. We're supposed to, to reach out to people, and we reach out to one, and, and he or she may tell somebody else, and then on and on and on. So that is uh, from John 1, verses 42-45. I'm going to get you to turn to 5, verse 27. I'll have you read that passage just a second. Luke 5. Luke 5, verse 27. <clears throat> now... Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22, and Mark 1, verses 16 through 20 are pretty much identical. Um, so, one day Jesus was walking, this is from uh, Matthew 4, 18. One day Jesus was walking along the shore beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, fishing with a net. They were commercial fishermen. Jesus called out to them, Come, be my disciples, I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and went, and went with him. And a little farther up the shore he saw two brothers, James and John, sitting on a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called to them too. They immediately followed him, leaving their boat and father behind. We'll read uh, Luke 5, verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. Okay, go ahead and read 28 to. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Levi and Matthew are one of the same. We know that a lot of the uh, disciples had nicknames, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that as well. And then uh, the last verse that I wanted to read was Luke 6, if you'll pull that up, uh, verses 12 through 16. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. 
Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Elpheus, and Simon, who was called a zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. You may notice that in some of the scripture, uh, we, the, the Philip was uh, went to get uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel and Bartholomew is one and the same. And of course, uh, a couple of Judases, we know there's definitely a difference in those. But most of these disciples had nicknames. Jesus even nicknamed some of them. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So Luke's gospel is the longest book in the New Testament. And his goal was to give the readers, one of his goals, give the readers a confidence in their faith. Luke is one of the synoptic gospels, we've all heard that term, a designation given to also to Matthew and Mark. Synoptic means with the same eye or viewpoint. So uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in the sense that they they share a chronology of Jesus's ministry, pretty much organized geographically. You know that in the in the scriptures, Jesus began by speaking in the northern part of biblical Palestine, around the Sea of Galilee, and um, Lake uh, Gennesaret and uh, Sea of Galilee are one and the same. Of course, uh, after Jesus uh, spent a good bit of time up around the Sea of Galilee, and a lot of scriptures record many of the miracles he did and the encounters he had with people, he ended up uh, going through, of course, Samaria and other um, other areas in, in the biblical Palestine before he ended up in Jerusalem where, of course, he was crucified, resurrected. Uh, and finished his three-year ministry in that regard. So Luke has some special uh, emphasis on certain people. He, uh, he, he demonstrated um, concern for people he considered to be sort of outcast. Of course, uh, he was a Gentile, so he had a special affinity for the Gentiles. And with Paul, spent a lot of time uh, evangelizing to the Gentiles and in, in Turkey and Macedonia and Greece, uh, Rome, uh, and really spent a lot of time with him and recorded those beautifully in the book of Acts. Samaritans, as we know, that weren't particularly uh, liked by the Jewish people. Luke spends time <clears throat> talking about them. And he had a, a, a special concern for certain individuals, those of the poor, those who were sick, particularly leprosy. Being a physician, he uh, probably had a, a special kinship with those folks. So that makes Luke a little different than the other synoptic gospels in that regard. He also um, emphasized uh, some of the ministry that the women had uh, assisting Jesus at the time. In verse one, we talk about he talks about the crowds. Crowds oftentimes did uh, just sort of engulf Jesus. There's a lot of people with a lot of different motives that follow Jesus. You know, some wanted the, uh, the bread of life, the uh, physical bread. And we know that through some of Jesus' miracles, he fed thousands of people. Some wanted to be healed. They followed him because of that. Some wanted to actually hear what he had to say. Some actually believed he was the Messiah. And they wanted to actually hear the word of God preached by him. And we know that, unfortunately, there was uh, some that just wanted to try to ensnare and trap him, namely the Pharisees. And uh, so he had a lot of people with a lot of different motives following him and the disciples. <clears throat> In verse 1, God's word, of course, is the Messiah. Jesus delivered God's word. And the Greek term for the word emphasizes the meaning of doctrines or teachings. And Jesus seemed to always speak in terms that common people could understand. Things like parables. He talked a lot about you know, agriculture, talked a lot about fishing, talked a lot about fruit. Things that people in that day understood because many were 
farmers, fishermen, and they understood what he's talking about when he tried to uh, tried to explain the kingdom of God in terms of these kinds of things like we just mentioned. Lake Gennesaret, it's a body of water known as the Sea of Galilee, freshwater lake. It's about uh, uh, 13 miles long, eight miles wide. It was in a, in a valley, of course, where most lakes are. And we know that the weather could get somewhat uh, violent, storms. There are scriptures that talk about Jesus calming the storms and how the uh, Oftentimes the disciples became quite uneasy when that happened and their faith sort of withered. Uh, Jesus calmed the storms. In the first century it was uh, an area where a lot of people lived because the fishing was good and uh, they used uh, small boats. The, uh, some of the archaeologists had found one of these ancient boats and they called it the Jesus boat or the ancient Galilee boat. It was approximately 27 feet long. They unearthed this thing. And of course, people <clears throat> used it for fishing as well as transport, as well as uh, moving goods across the lake. And uh, the fishermen that uh, used these boats were among Jesus' first disciples, as we read in Scripture. Peter, Andrew, James, John, they all worked as fishermen. And fishermen were sometimes characterized as uh, very hard workers, a bit on the rough side, maybe a little crude in speech. Uh, but again, Jesus uses people of all sorts uh, to get the message out and to uh, find disciples. I find it sort of hard to believe that disciple John, who was fisherman with the eloquent writings that he had in the Gospels of uh, Gospel of Luke and in, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation that he's such an eloquent writer found it hard to believe without divine intervention that he could do all this beautiful writing. In verse 2 it talks about washing their nets. Fishing nets were made of uh, woven twine or cord and uh, there was basically two types of nets that they used. Uh, one was a kind of cone ship, a shaped net that uh, had wide openings, and we still use those to catch bait fish with. Um, you've seen people, you may have, some of y'all may use it. To, you know, it's kind of a technique, you sling those things out, and they'll, they'll let weights go around the, the bait fish, and then you, and it closes down around them, you pull them up. That was one of the type of nets they used. They also used these uh, seines that they would drag behind the boat. They'd kind of have a, a float on the front and some lead weights or whatever on the back, and they would drag them uh, through there and uh, through the water, kind of like a drag net. Uh, and of course, since they were sort of uh, fragile, uh, you can imagine when they get got hung on rocks or or whatever, they would sometimes tear. So when they got through fishing all night, they would wash their nets and 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 then let them dry out for the next night's fishing. And uh, so, verse 3, it says Jesus sat down and he was teaching. In the first century, rabbis typically sat down to teach, and people would sort of surround them and give them honor and respect and listen to what they had to say. So we're going to transition to the next section, which emphasizes how life-changing faith is demonstrated when we simply just do what... Jesus tells us to do. So, Will, if you'll read Luke 5, verses 4 through 7 for us, please. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. So the point of this particular scripture is that faith is just simply acting on what Christ calls us to do. Verse uh, 5 
all night long. Simon was a, a skilled fisherman, we know that. Nighttime was the best time for fishing. So after toiling all night with no results, Peter might have been a little reluctant after he'd already washed his nets and started to dry them and whatnot. And Jesus walks up and says, go out and let's do this again. They have been a little bit reluctant, but, but because of his faith, and all Peter uh, says, but if you say so, so it reveals Peter's obedience in spite of his uh, immediate reluctance. He had known Jesus long enough to know that he was special, and he had witnessed Jesus heal his mother-in-law in Luke 4, so he knew the Master's words were much more important than any other human experience or human knowledge. So thus he was just prepared to act in faith, although it appeared somewhat illogical to him. Zoologists in modern times have counted about 30 different species of fish in uh, Lake Gennesaret. Many of these species differ from those found elsewhere. Same thing in our, in our, our region, our, our country. Uh, there's a lot of different fish in Alaska and whatnot than there is in uh, South Texas. Um, so fishing comprised uh, one of the most common occupations in that part of the world. Um, it provided uh, food, of course, uh, for the population. And it was a very important uh, occupation for the people. In verse 6 it says their nets began to tear. They were actually uh, breaking in two according to the Greek language. Uh, as a result they would likely lose uh, all the fish they had caught. And this emphasizes the unbelievable miracle that they had witnessed that Jesus had uh, provided for them. And it goes on to say in verse 7 that the boats were so full they began to sink. And so Simon and Andrew had to call James and John, which were their um, part of their consortium, their fishing consortium there. And the boats were just about to sink. And again, you can imagine the amount of fish that Jesus commanded to be caught right then. That just again emphasizes the tremendous miracle that these disciples were witnessing. So we're going to transition now um, to see what God's call upon our lives brings us out of the ordinary and ushers us into special adventures in our life. So, well, if you'll read Luke 5, verses 8 through 11. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So the connection uh, to this point of scripture is that Jesus calls us to a life of trust in him. And to me, verse 11 kind of sums it all up. When, once they got the boats back to land, they left everything and they followed him, totally committed. In verse 8, Simon Peter, Luke uh, referred to Simon as Simon Peter for the first time. Jesus had given... Uh, Simon, the name Peter meaning rock. Paul often referred to Peter as Cephas. It's an Aramaic term for rock. We think of Peter sometimes as being kind of an impulsive uh, buffoon. You know, he always came up with things that astonished everybody, but he sometimes uh, exhibited deep spiritual perception. Other times, as we know, during the arrest of Jesus. He did not die even knowing Jesus. We also know through Acts of the Apostles, which I think maybe should have been labeled and named Acts of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, in any case, Peter, who was a, an uneducated fisherman, now became an inspired evangelist who helped 
over 3,000 people become Christians and followers of the Lord. And we know without the Holy Spirit involved in his life that probably wouldn't have happened. In verse 8, it says he fell at Jesus' knees. This posture indicated that Peter recognized he was in the presence of God. Only divine power could have done what just happened in this miraculous catch of fish to the point the boats were about to sink. <clears throat> Falling at Jesus' knees or feet revealed the reverence Peter had for his master. Sometimes when things get really rough, getting on your knees, I know it's harder to get up now at our age, but sometimes getting on your knees is what it takes. In verse 8, Peter says, Go away from me because I'm a sinful man. He recognized when he was in the presence of Jesus, he was in the presence of God. He called, in verse 8, he said the word Lord. Sometimes translated Master, this title is normally used in the New Testament, referring to Jesus as capital Lord. Some, some translations even have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is different than a regular Master or Lord. You remember Thomas, he professed, we call him Doubting Thomas, but uh, after Jesus' resurrection, he, he appeared to the disciples. I think Thomas said something like, well, you know, when I see the wounds, I'll, I'll buy into this. And when Jesus appeared, showed him his wounds, he said, my Lord and my God. The declaration, Jesus is Lord, apparently became the earliest expression of faith in the first century church. In verse 10, James, for the first time Luke referred to Simon's partners by the name James and John. As one of the twelve, we know that James, along with Peter and John, formed Jesus' inner circle. They were with him on the, at the time of the transfiguration. Jesus seemed to spend a little more time with them, and they were all written about much more in this, the Gospels. You know, I could be wrong, but I don't remember reading in the Bible much about the calling from the other disciples that Will just read. Um, maybe there, I just don't remember, but I, you know, these, these first disciples that we're speaking of in this scripture seems to be the ones that are referred to the most. Of course, we know that Judas Iscariot, we know how it went for him. And we know a little bit about Matthew, which is also called Levi, being the tax collector. Of course, the Pharisees used uh, Jesus' relationship with, with Matthew as um, you know, fodder for criticizing him. Jesus called James and John sons of thunder. Although James and John asked Jesus for special positions in his kingdom, Jesus promised them that they would share in his sufferings. Indeed, James became the first of the twelve to suffer martyrdom. We read about it in Acts 12. John, along with uh, James, was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. The five books in the New Testament attributed to John were, of course, the Gospel of John which primarily that book was written to emphasize the deity of Jesus, that he was fully God, fully human. John, first, second, and third John, which I read the other night, reread the other night, um, was written to, in, in Ephesus by John to um, combat some of the heresy that was going on in the early church, to uh, emphasize about the faith that people needed to have and of course as time went on after these books were written uh, you know 30 years after Jesus's uh, 
death and resurrection, people were starting to, um, you might say, pervert the Christian message. Um, and so John wrote these books to kind of get people back lined out. And also from the Isle of Ephesus where John was exiled, he wrote the book of Revelation. Of course, all these books were truly written by God for our consumption uh, through the various authors that pen them. So, John lived to be an old man. We believe uh, he was probably the only one that was not martyred for the faith. Verse 10, Jesus says, don't be afraid. That's a typical uh, reaction, I guess, to, to God would be in God's presence would be fear. We know that um, when God's messengers, the angels, appeared to many folks in the Bible, first thing they said was, don't be afraid. <laughs> but I don't know about y'all, but if they... That God appeared to me today, or the angels started speaking to me, I, I would probably be a little afraid. Verse 10, from now on you'll be catching people. Some translations, I think, and we learn uh, you'll be fishers of men. So this event marked a real turning point in Peter's life. Jesus addressed this uh, disciple's mission in terms Peter would understand, terminology related to him as a fisherman. You're not going to be catching fish anymore. You're going to be out catching people. And the day of Pentecost, as we spoke about earlier, revealed Peter's faithfulness to the point that 3,000 people became followers of Jesus, became some of the first Christians in the first century church. In verse 11, it says they left everything and they followed him. Simon Peter, along with his fishing partners, left their boats, left their business. Um, James and John uh, left all that with, with their father. It was a commitment that they made. We, we talked a little bit about when we started this lesson that this was probably not the first encounter that Jesus had had with these folks. They had probably witnessed some of his miracles, had heard some of the stuff that Jesus had done to heal folks and some of the miracles. But this is a turning point in their life to where they got truly committed to be followers of Jesus. Luke referred to the term follow to denote Christian discipleship. He made clear in his gospel that all believers, not just the 12, were called to follow Christ. Of course, the nature of the calling is different for everyone. Everyone from, from people like us to missionaries who go into foreign lands, risk their lives. Uh, we are called, of course, to support these folks through prayer, through uh, financial giving, which this church in Manhattan has always been since we've been affiliated and members of this church have been very good about supporting our missionaries. But the ability to follow Jesus assumes the experience of forgiveness that enables believers to follow him in discipleship. That's why I want y'all to keep praying for the new minister of discipleship and missions because it is very important. Brad laid a good foundation, in my opinion, for missions. Um, ben has been very aggressive about going not only locally, but um, internationally and statewide and a lot of mission endeavors. Some of y'all may have been involved in some of that ministry. So the writer of this lesson has a, a part called Live It Out. And he, they ask us to examine, uh, take an inventory of your heart. Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads? I thought about this before. I thought, man, I hope he didn't call me to go to Africa and be a missionary and sleep on the ground with my back and my neck. <laughs> of course, Betty tells me, well, you know what? If he calls you to do that, he's going to take care of all that. I'm sure you're right. 
I just hope he doesn't, doesn't call me to do that, okay? <laughs> the writer says, drop a net. We all have unnecessary, useless activities and pursuits. Thinking about technology and cell phones and stuff like that. Probably gets in our way of prayer time, Bible study, maybe visiting the sick, praying for people, things like that. The writer uh, says, this week drop uh, something to make room for God's call. You know, if we're so busy, we don't. Uh, we may pray for a lot of stuff, and we may think about it, people, and you know, all that sort of thing. But if we don't stop long enough to listen to what God has to say to us, if we get that busy, we're going to miss the boat, right? And they also say, speak, share your personal story of salvation with somebody who uh, isn't a follower of Christ. <clears throat> you know, that's kind of hard for most folks. But wouldn't you agree that a personal Witness a personal story is probably the most powerful thing you could do rather than just preaching to them or talking to them. Tell them what Jesus has done for you in your life. It also says engage. It's part if you say so. Peter said if you say so. When, when Jesus said go cast your nets out in the middle of the Deep water, Philip saying, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm the fisherman here. Fished all night, didn't catch a thing. And now he's saying, do that. But I'll, if you say so, I'll do it. The writer asks, is there something in your life where you know that Jesus has already asked of you and you haven't done it yet? Or an area where you know that following what following Jesus looks like, but you find it difficult to obey? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and... and uh, own up to that, but I, I think we all probably are guilty of, uh, and maybe feel a little guilty because there are probably some things we know we should be doing or not. And the writer also says, what excuses or explanations keep you from obeying Jesus wholeheartedly? Anybody want to raise their hand and share? <laughs> point of this lesson for me after reading and studying for a few minutes is that once you accept that Jesus is your Savior that's great the most important decision you've ever made but the commitment there just like the disciples the commitment and we're all disciples the commitment there is to get out of your comfort zone get out of your boat Drop your, drop your stuff, what you're doing, and, and get with the program. Do what Jesus asked you to do. In, in your heart, you probably already know what you need to be doing. Get serious about it. Um, some people call it getting convicted. It's a commitment. And that's what they did, exactly. And they followed him, and eventually all but John were martyred for their faith. So, to wrap it up, I'm supposed to remind the group that faith in Jesus is always, cha always challenges us to leave the comfortable and complacent behind and beckon us to live radically for Him. And I'll add, just like the disciples did, they were all comfortable in their fishing business, I'm assuming, but they wouldn't have been doing it. And uh, they left it all behind to follow Jesus. Okay. So that is the um, end of the lesson. Any comments? Okay. So thanks for coming today and being part of this group. And be careful in the cold weather. Pray for our, our search committee uh, that we find the... Uh, the right one who's called by God to lead our church in this way and pray for our rest of our pastors and their, them and their families and everything they do. Larry and Mary Beth should be back next week. So, let's close with a prayer. Gary Ray, would you close?
Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for bringing us together this morning to have this time of Bible study. Thank you for Bob and the lesson he brought this morning. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you give us and for your love and your grace. And we just pray that we would uh, put aside the things that are keeping us from following you this week. We pray for the Brother Jacob this morning as he brings the message and we pray for those that have never accepted you as their Lord and Savior that today would be the day. Father, we love you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.